Hi everybody, my name is Marta Mama. I'm your basic queer bitch and since I'm from Spain but I grew up in the US, I think I have kind of a unique perspective on Drag Race España, so let me explain you all the references. <laughs> So this is the sixth episode of the second season and this episode is the ball. But well, let's start from the beginning. Um, we're all devastated that Onyx left. I think like a lot of people admire Onyx and the girls are like Onyx's biggest fans. And I love that. Sithless is very sad, as you know, but probably all of them, like everyone watching at home is devastated as well. And then since there's seven of them left, they say, oh, I know what we can do. Uh, this next challenge is going to be Ana Locking y los Siete. And that's from a TV show that Ana Obregón did, Ana y los Siete. So that's what they're talking about. It's like, you know, the name comes from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Then we see the little message from Supreme. And I, did, I don't know if you guys saw that her earrings was a chorizo and a morcilla, which are two types of like sausages that we have in Spain. And I think that was introducing this week's guest, which is Choriza May. We don't have a mini challenge this week, so the pit crew comes in and they have three very big containers. One has plastic, the other one has paper, and the other one has metal. And, uh, okay, about the pit crew, it is true that we're still getting close-ups from the guys' bulges, but this week we had one queer pit crew member, Ander, and he looked great, he was wearing makeup, and I really needed this because I think that queer is sexy too. And if you're putting a lot of men and they are like the example of what a sexy guy is, you should include queer people because queer is sexy too. Of course, my favorite part the whole episode <laughs> is when Estrella just rips her pants and you can see her ass completely out. Uh, I don't know, like, does Estrella ever wear underwear? Because she wasn't wearing underwear in the last episode. She said that, like, she was changing and she wasn't wearing anything underneath. Uh, and then this week she wasn't wearing underwear as well. So was that, like, on purpose or something? And she says, hey, hey, editors, how are you doing? You're gonna have to edit my ass. Beautiful ass, if I may say so. So they have to, this week, they are going to present on the runway a 10th century look, a 20th century look. And they have to create the 30th century look from those materials. And when Supreme comes into the workroom to talk with the girls, she kneels down, she's on the floor talking to them at their same level. This, I think, this speaks volumes about Supreme and about Drag Race España in general. It's something that's very simple. I'm sure that she didn't even think about that when she was in the workroom. But would you imagine RuPaul doing that? Or Brooklyn Heights? Maybe Brooklyn, but you know, I think it speaks volumes. It, it is not about what you say or being this huge guru with all the knowledge. What we really need in a host is someone that understands them at their same level. And Supreme is like one of them and I'm absolutely loving that. So all the girls are saying that they cannot sew. They're all very super worried. There's not one confident uh, queen in the room. And like even the ones that know how to sew are like downplaying their skills a little bit because you know if you say oh i'm great at sewing then you know the more expectations you have the easier it is for you to fail it wasn't that bad it wasn't that bad we'll see that later but they're all saying oh it's terrible i thought it was going to be terrible and estrella gets to read a beautiful letter from her best friend ivan 
and I was already scared with this edit. I was like, ooh, Estrella, ooh, be careful. But yeah, it was a very beautiful letter and I think it's important from time to time having like a little reminder about the importance of the chosen family in Drag Race because it's something that it, it is very crucial for the LGBT community. So I love that she had that tiny little moment. And the guest judge this week is Choritha May and she was looking amazing. This look by Choritha May is like a futuristic interpretation of the regional costume of Valencia. So she is a fallera, but she made that outfit to look more futuristic so it would fit in the theme. And she wasn't able to do a fallera look for her roots, like my roots runway that they had in Drag Race UK, but she really wanted to do it. So she was finally able to wear this outfit. She looks like the queen of the universe that comes from Valencia. I just love it. In Valencia, it is very usual having like fireworks. It's something very traditional there. So she's talking about like the yellow and the red of the fire and the little parts of uh, purple would be like the Valencian night sky where the, you know, where the fireworks would be. But red, yellow and purple are also the colors of the Republican flag in Spain. As I've said before, like our flag, our Spanish flag is something a little bit problematic because it was a huge, huge, huge symbol of identity for the dictatorship that we had for 40 years. The Spanish uh, flag is something that means more things than just being proud of your country. It's like a symbol for the bigots many times. And the other flag, it's a non-constitutional flag and everything, and it is like a leftist symbol here in Spain. So since the runway this week is 10th century, 20th century, and 30th century, I wanted to invite someone very special that I admire a lot. Um, this person is an archaeologist, and he's a very big YouTuber, and he's someone that I admire very much, and he is also a big Drag Race fan and a queer icon himself. So thank you very much for coming, Puto Miquel. Hi, Miquel, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm fine. It's raining a lot here. I'm a bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, did you enjoy this episode? What did you think of the girls? I actually, I really enjoyed this episode. I was kind of nervous for the, for the, for the ball because they were presenting themselves as like, no one is a seamstress. So they were like yeah. always making reference to like, oh no, I can't sew. Oh no, I can't sew. Oh no, I can't sew. I was like, okay, it's going to be a mess. But it was good. It was great, actually. Okay. And you have some background about actually like, medieval fashion is that correct yeah. can you tell yeah, us a little I, bit so i did my undergrad uh dissertation in medieval andalusian so the islamic part of spain uh in the during the middle ages in yeah in the textiles that we preserve from that are preserved from that period but obviously you see like the elite fashion rather than the <laughs> yeah it was really interesting it's really interesting because it's a mo moment in time where like there's a lot of um communication and, and and trade between the elites even though you're supposed to understand them as like enemies because ones are muslims and the others are christian they actually um rich people being rich they shared a common sort of language of luxury and textiles and affluence and stuff like that so it was, it was really interesting that's so cool. You're a you're, you're a nerd. <laughs> Just like I am me. sorry. I am sorry. I'm going to go. It's actually a compliment me. here, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, so let's go with the runway. No one better than you. What we're going to do is we're going to play the girls one by one instead okay. of each category because I think most of the girls have like a common theme throughout yeah. the three looks or something. We're going to start with Sharon first. Okay. The common theme that Sharon had throughout the three of her looks was opulence. So yeah. Sharon's 10th, 10th century look was this rich lady that was obsessed with all her jewels and all her gold, and she's actually hiding them under her garments. What do you think about this look? 
I liked it. I mean, I like the, I think the choice of the color for the cave was sort of like a nod to the Kingdom of Asturias. And then the crosses that she has are sort of like nods to like this gothic or early medieval jewelry, I think. But then at the same time, when like the cave, when she revealed it, I think that it was like there was something missing. I don't know, like maybe like a skirt or something. I, I understand the reveal, but at the same time, I don't know. There was something missing for me. And uh, but overall, I mean, Sharon can do nothing wrong, to be fair. <laughs> exactly. Maybe it was the proportions or something. I don't know. Yeah. Is it true that colors like, or is it only in paintings, like colors like blue were very difficult to produce? Oh, yeah, actually. Uh, well, technically, for, it, for blue, you would have to get indigo. And that was a very expensive um, um, very expensive dye. And it was very rich to to dress in in those light blues definitely i'm sure shadow doesn't actually know all those things no but you know <laughs> she doesn't have not. to so let's say like the reference that we pick up were completely intentional <laughs> yeah exactly whatever we think is completely on purpose <laughs> yeah. i love her makeup though she did a different thing with her makeup for every single runway yeah. for every single episode like this woman yeah is a professional. I don't, I don't understand how the, like, I, I love the makeup, but at the same time, I do not know how it matches with the character that she was playing. I think it's like a fashion interpretation mm. of uh, what a queen looks like from our theatrical 21st yeah. century standards, like Queen of Hearts, like all the references that we have from film cartoons and theater and plays all mixed yeah. up doesn't really make sense with 10th century but what are you going to do with your makeup nah, like? <laughs> it's, it's fine it's fine Sharon's second look she for the 20th century she decided to go with the euro <laughs> but there's a little problem with this can you explain me what that is <laughs> when she said for me the, the symbol of the 20th century is the richness that we started when we entered the euro is that well we start we entered the euro in 2001 or 2002 yeah 2002 yeah <laughs> yeah so it was like basically in the 21st start of the 21st century but you know what again who who cares <laughs> yeah she could have done no. something with pesetas though I th like that's what i was gonna say like i think it's because it was much more difficult to find the print for pesetas maybe i don't know but like that would have been great actually this look wasn't very much 20th century and we've seen uh outfits done with like dollar bills before yeah. many times this one was a different way of doing it she didn't try like to cover the whole thing she had the print i guess this is just a print fabric and then under that she had the like a bodysuit with just like rolled up euro bills it's colorful it's fun i know there's something about why is she wearing just one glove i'm just realizing that now oh me too <laughs> oh it's absolutely intentional, you know, that's the probably for this yes, <laughs> there's a there's a thought behind it somewhere. And the third look for her opulence, I thought this was very interesting. So this is the one she did with like recycled material, basically. Yeah. And you have like the two sides of what she thinks that fashion is going to be in the 30th century. She talks about like there's no actual money and you have to trade gold and uh, you're going to have even bigger extremes between the richest richest and the poorest of the poor what do you think what what do you imagine like the 30th century be like i was thinking like i was thinking about it but it's an open it's such an open category that at the same time like it says so much about you. That's why I think it's great because obviously you're you can go post-apocalyptic. You can go. Most people are going post-apocalyptic because we're fucked, I guess. But like, <laughs> um, but you can sort of imagine like very uh, genderless, or you can imagine something that has broken with so many barriers that we have today. So it's really great to sort of play that and what it says about each queen. I think how you imagine the future rather than a theme that's more like. Um, more guided, I guess. Yeah, more specific. but I love this look. And okay. the face, um, I think it, that was very smart because I am absolutely sure that they had to uh, do the three looks in the same day. 
Yeah. So yeah, she only that. had to do like a big makeup in one side of her face and it looks really cool. I mean, if I were her, I would have just taken off half of my makeup and do just the half that's painted. But she evidently did the whole face again, which is, again, as you say, in the same day. And I like the I like the silhouette that she did, like didn't RuPaul did in one of the promos, kind of like something similar, but it was white, something like yeah. with a spiky. Kind and of, then Naomi like, Smalls, I think, did something similar. Yeah, and it's a great silhouette. I mean, it must be it must be simpler to make than I think, but it is kind of like very stylized as well, which is great. And I like the asymmetry. Let's go with the next one. Let's go with our core Estrella. So I this is Estrella's 10th century look. Um, yeah. I spoke with her this morning. And of course, the running theme throughout the three categories is like the uh like the army like the military power and yeah. in all three of them she shares like she has purple hair and she has like a red detail so she tried yeah. to do like aesthetically also a running theme throughout three looks so this one here she says she yeah, says it's, not... this is from a mercenary but this looks more like a templario yeah, I mean, it's and it's closer to uh, the Imperio what she's doing. These kind of uh, night orders that were sort of uh, had vows of chastity and they were like religious, but also military. And like the cross that she has is of the Orden of Calatrava, which took after a lot of like the Templar sort of influence. I mean, she said that she just Googled uh, a, a cross and that was it. But it is a Spanish and it is also kind of funny because it is a Spanish um, order, military order. So it was kind of, founded in the 12th century we'll forgive the two centuries in the middle it's fine uh, but it was founded like in the 12th century in spain during the reconquista so during the fights against islamic iberia i like this look but it's difficult to make it not look cheap i guess yes like, because i think she chose materials that are cheap kind of intentionally like the rope hour i think this is probably mm -hmm. linen like burlap or something because it is even like yeah. if you see the bottom it's already like shredding i guess yeah but i guess that's like the monk part of the templario yeah. not the best look for her i think it wasn't her favorite look either like she agrees <laughs> second look wow. is her franco look yeah we also, I think every Spanish person that saw this, like, was screaming and, but uh, this has a lot of layers and can be misinterpreted in many different ways in many other places. Um, mm. We have been using uh, fascist symbolism in, the, like, the counterculture movement and in the drag culture uh, for many years because it's a way that countries have of healing from the past and finding humor and things that are not humorous <laughs> and <laughs> you know making things a little bit less serious uh, what is they explained is that she, of course making a character gay is not something that is going to make them funnier because being gay is not something you know to laugh at something but um uh, she wanted to do something that franco would have hated let's make something fun out of something that is a big tragedy because as lgbtq community we all agree basically <laughs> almost everyone that this Hopefully. was a very terrible time for the whole community yeah yeah and i think it's I think, I mean, it is kind of um, same as Mel Brooks with Spring Pattern for Hitler, like kind of like depriving that fa that fascist figure of their power by putting them in a situation that they would have hated, basically. It's not so much, as you say, like making, uh, making it ridiculous just because it's gay or whatever. Like it's more like the dissonance between what we know from history and what we are sort of seeing now as this, this figure. And I love it. I, I mean, I love the, um, I love that she did this and, and I think it was, it was very important that someone did it for, for Spain 20th century because it was very, it, it, it was a, a very big part of, of our history, sadly, but like it is what it is. And so to transform it and sort of making, making it more powerful in, from an LGBT perspective, I think it's really important. Yeah, so for people that don't know who this person is, 
Uh, she's doing a drag version of Francisco Franco, who was our dictator basically for 40 years of the 20th century. So for a very long time, uh, we had a fascist regime and um, it was illegal, obviously, to just to be gay. It was illegal to dress as a different gender, whatever that means. And yeah. of course, his self-image, Franco's self-image, he was very much in control of. But um, now he doesn't control the mm -hmm. image, his image and what we say about him. And I guess people outside of Spain are going to understand that this is like a very important part of like counterculture art. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it is kind of true that like seeing the fascist um, salute can can sort of impact a lot of people if they don't know the context. But it is kind of in that sort of Mock, mockery of our history or like resign not resignifying but sort of reclaiming um the past that we sort of like were denied I think one something that could have like made it not not elevate or anything it's just like it, because you know that Franco and like a lot of fascist regimes like in general figures they use a lot of the gallons and the the medals to sort of like boast themselves up a bit even more and it's like it gets even exaggerated where the lapel is like full of of like it's jewelry basically like yeah. you could like she could have like put push it a bit even further with that but I, I love everything about it I love that we saw this in on the on the main stage and the the reveal when she turns around and her ass is out and what about her 30th century look well I mean uh Charifa may said it best uh baked potato realness <laughs> <laughs> like, this like, is so ugly like poor thing yeah. The thing is with, I think with her, when you see this, you don't, uh, you don't like immediately say, this is so ugly. I hate this. You say, oh, poor Estrella, because people <laughs> want her to do good. Like, yeah. I don't know, you're rooting for her all the time, even though she looks terrible. She yeah. knows that she looked terrible. She said it all the time. She agreed. We have Benedita Bondage. Okay, I spoke with her too. Uh, this was not her first idea. That's why she chose a moon. And this is actually burlap. And it was painted by the graffiti artist that painted her Almodovar book. So it does look like a printed fabric. This is, I thought, if now that I know that, I think it's a lot cooler. The thing is that, does this fit in the category? I don't think so. I mean, she she sort of like went on a long route of explaining why, and and I guess yes, but like the only thing that she's sort of holding is the astrolabe to sort of like, oh yeah, it's like astronomy rather than just like I'm dressed like an emoji. Uh, <laughs> and I and I like it is it would make sense the 10th century astronomy, Islamic astronomy, boom, whatever, and the astro the astrolabe was sort of invented around that area. So it, yes. But again, like it, it feels like she. I, I mean, I wonder what her first choice was, but it feels like she had, like she had that for another look that she wanted to do, and then she just decided to like, oh, I think it fits. Let's stick a an astral out to it. I think, but I, I mean, I think she tried to do something similar than what Setlas does, that we we will see that later, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that she picks something from the 10th century and then yeah. that is basically the theme and you can do something very fashion then about that but we have astronomy studies from the ancient greeks from yeah. egypt yeah from it could have been from anyone like yeah. any it could be from the 20th century in 1969 when people landed on the moon <laughs> I mean, it could have been from like that movie with the um, yeah where the moon the... gets a rocket on her eye. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like the reveal when she like sort of revealed the lights. I mean, that yeah. was cute. I love the look. That... It's the theme, the category. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then we have another very good one. Yeah, this person is Carmen Polo. This is the wife of Franco. So we just had Franco in the look with Estrella, and she was Franco's wife. Um, mm -hmm. She was called by the people La Collares, the necklace lady. Let's say because she always wore a lot of necklaces, and, and because she... she stole them. 
she was <laughs> because uh, she stole them. <laughs> yeah, because basically she was the wife of the of the dictator. So basically she went through all the jewelry shops in Gran Vía in Madrid and basically took whatever she wanted because no one was going to protest her. And that, and so she stole a lot of jewelry. That's why she's sort of like getting uh, pearl beads out of her out of her vagina. She has a couple of things. She she is wearing a mantilla. That's like the white piece of fabric that she has on her head. On her head with um, una peineta, that's the like con type. This is not correctly done. A man you don't put a mantilla this way, but it's very difficult to put to yourself if you don't have enough time. And then she has a sign on her back that says, Franco ha muerto, Franco oh, yeah, died. Yeah. yeah, those words are like very iconic in Spain. Why? Because that's what how, how it was announced. Uh, Span Spaniards. Franco, well, Franco ha muerto, Franco has died. And, and Arias Navarro, the person who was saying it, like started crying and I think people started celebrating, but you know what? <laughs> <It's their own. laughs> and her third look, I think was just amazing. She talks about in the 13th century, we wouldn't have any more actual raw material to make clothes with. So it hmm. will all come from you know, plastic lasts for thousands of years. So we'll probably still be using plastic that we're using now. Yeah, I love how it's constructed because obviously like, I, I think she understands proportions perfectly and she did it like it's not over because it's very easy to when you start merging all those things together to make it very cluttered, I guess. But she sort of like left that blank space on her chest and she likes being naked obviously, but like she's sort of like, balance it perfectly I don't know like it goes very well together and the colors go perfectly together okay and next up in the runway we have the Amante Mary Brown this look is inspired by the Mezquita de Cordoba de Cordoba Mosque tell me a little bit about this I mean so this this was my favorite look of the night overall I think a, because obviously I have a bit of a bias because I do Islamic archaeology, but it is sort of like, it is 10th century, first of all, because it's one of the last expansion of the Mosque of Cordoba is the moment that the Emirate of, the Caliphate of Cordoba is at the height of their power, but also like all the details that Diamante did, like of the architecture. It's not only like she had sort of like the, um, a pattern on the code that sort of like emulates this mashrabiya. The lattice work that they sort of use, like it's very, it's a very, that geometry is very, very typical of Islamic and Andalusi um, art and architecture. That, But she also has the, the color is sort of like when she pops it up, it's yes. the shape of an art of one of the arches of the, of the mosque. The mosque itself is very representative of, of the Umayyad power. It's very representative of like a very specific period in, in the, in the history of Spain and if the category is Spain 10th century it, like it fits perfectly and even the the sort of like the baggy pants the harem pants and all that like the it's constantly trying to emulate that sort of Islamic Spain it's a very curated look in general it's very very detailed and I don't understand why they said like uh, it was not dragging up what they meant is that she's not wearing boobs and she's not wearing a wig but, you know, there are ladies out there with no hair and no yeah. boobs and, you know. Yeah, and also, like, and also, like, she, I mean, Diamante is a queen that normally, like, does a lot of looks without a wig. And it's perfectly acceptable, obviously, and valid as a drag queen. But also, like, she's also dressing for an, a period of time where, like, they would have their their head covered anyway. They say the proportions are off balance if you're not wearing hair, but... A Muslim lady would not wear her hair out in that period yeah. of time, nor now. And when she pops her collar up, she fixes those proportions perfectly. Yeah, yeah so, I think if she had walked down the runway with the collar popped off, maybe would have like they wouldn't have that critique. And even the even the code, like the the underlining of the code, like the the pattern that goes on the red. That is basically how the arches look in the mosque, of course. Like it's so it's so detailed, the red and the white and the like it's it she transformed a building into a, an outfit. And I don't know how that is not drag, basically. So her running theme throughout the three runways was buildings. And her look for the 20th century 
was La Casa Batlló uh, from mm -hmm. Barcelona. This is a building made by Gaudí. And it's famous that in El Día de San Jordi, they cover the whole building with roses. It's very traditional. Um, do you see Gaudí here? I didn't. I, I, I like the outfit. And I sort of was like, oh, just um, Andalusi, an uh, Andalusian lady, whatever. Like very, very 1920 sort of silhouette, maybe. I don't know, like some sort of thing but then she started explaining I was like oh I mean I like the outfit I didn't read Gaudi for me but yeah. I like it per se I think she looks gorgeous with this hair yeah Something and the mask so and everything I, I really like it yeah and I don't e even understand the Barcelona part like I, I don't understand why she went there she's not from Barcelona she <laughs> I don't really understand why but she does look gorgeous though her third look is like a post-apocalyptic look from a building that maybe was used for communication, you know, after the end of the world and we're already in the 13th century. And it's supposed to be like an old building that now is all destroyed and where people yeah. are ba basically surviving. I asked her if this was supposed to be Torre España y Piruli in Madrid, oh. which is a building that looks similar. But it's actually not. It was she just invented it. But you know the rule. <laughs> yes, this is completely intentional. Yeah, it, was, it was very much that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why the judges critique this look. It, I mean, for me, it's simple and it's like it's not it's not well made. But it would it would have been perfectly safe in any other. Like it's sort of like okay, I I understand what you're sort of going for. She backed herself into a corner by saying, my theme is going to be architecture. If you're not a seamstress, why are you looking to make a, a, a theme, right? If you've seen the Amante life, this is a very, very elevated look for the Amante, who is usually mm. wearing a jumpsuit or a bodysuit or just yeah. a bra and panties. She, this is very elevated for her. If I see her in a party looking like this, I would be work bitch because... You know, for me in drag, um, you can have different languages. Like fashion yeah. is a language that you can use to tell something, to explain something. And there are some queens that you use different languages. Some queens use performance. Some queens use, uh, like there are many different parts of being a drag queen. And this is yeah. not her language. This is not her native tongue. Let's go with the next one. That is Setlas. Okay. Uh... So cute. We love Setlas. So Setlas decided to do something very interesting. He told Las Glosas Emilianenses, which are the first texts that we have in the Spanish language, because the Spanish language comes from Latin. But in the medieval ages, of course, only basically like the priests were knew how to write and Latin was the only languages that they wrote. But the people spoke a derivation like a, an, an evol evolution of latin that that was like spanish and french and catalan and portuguese and all these other languages so in order for them to understand what they were even writing down they started making like tiny little notes in the books and those are the first texts that we have in spanish so uh, she decided to take that concept she printed some fabric and she did a fabulous look the smartest thing she's done yeah i i love this look i think that even though it's simple because it is a pattern fabric then then you sort of like print something on and that's it but like she sort of i don't know she shows a very interesting silhouette even with the cape and everything i was trying to figure out what she was wearing on on like the head what the headpiece was and how it tied with the but i think it's more a color pattern thing but yeah. the 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 cotton well, the, the the outfit itself is and the fact that she printed the she covered her platforms with the Glossas Emilianenses for me, like had me <laughs> cackling when I was watching this, like, yes, of course. <laughs> Can you imagine those priests in the 10th century oh my God. <laughs> looking at this? And she also chose communication, like a, a through line, which is like, yeah, communication, yeah. how it has evolved. And it, that was, again, uh, she defended it perfectly. Second look, she decided to do like the internet. My absolute top from the runway, other than the Amantes look, is probably this hair. Yeah, the hair and the neck piece, like, uh, I mean, it's amazing. It, it all merges together yeah. so, so perfectly, even though, obviously, 
so easy to make that look and make it look like you're just wearing a bunch of garbage. There, it's something interesting too because you're using like the binary code and everything yeah. in a moment where she's always talking about the non-binary thing, yeah. you know, in gender. <laughs> so it's like play on words with the binary thing. Um, she looks amazing. This hair is great. The judges say that she looks like if herself was a number one and the <laughs> round thing around her was the zero. Uh, and she says like, yeah, I didn't even think of that, but absolutely, yeah, I thought of that. And my favorite look from the three of them was the third look. So we started with the origin of communication and this is the end of communication. Hmm. So this is like a futuristic era where you cannot communicate, her lips are sealed and she doesn't have hands to communicate anymore. Uh, her brain is so fat. Yeah. Fatter than her ass. <laughs> <laughs> a queen for the Canary Islands will see car cardboard and will be like, see a world of possibilities, whereas other people see garbage. The people that are from the Canary Islands, since the Gala Drag de Gran Canaria is like a huge, huge, huge stage with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. That's why all their drag is so big because you have to be able to see it from a very far distance. And when they are preparing for this, because they live in small islands that are very far away from the rest of Spain, many times they have to travel abroad. They have to go to Turkey. They have to go to different countries just to buy rhinestones and fabric. So they're very used to like almost as, you know, the survival of an artist to take unconventional material and make something huge and beautiful and just yeah. make it work. Satellite is so small as we have already, <laughs> like they have said several times and she commands the stage every time with obviously not only the platforms but also the big proportions and everything. If I have to say something, I would say that she had her lips sealed, but, um, it didn't look like sealed. It just looked like closed and white. Maybe yeah. if she yeah. had put some something like wires to or fill, something, or something to fill in between the two lips, like yeah. you know, it looks a little more like Neo in the Matrix, or you know, something yeah. that looks that you cannot see the separation between the two lips. That gives yeah. a lot more the effect. But if they had an hour and a half to put all this on, I'm sure she had to glue it on to herself. Mm. Like, this is crazy. Let's go with the next one. Marina. Okay, uh, Marina has already explained her looks. We know that the theme was a wedding. And she also wanted to take one specific material to tell the story of that era. So for the 10th century, she chose wheat. I, I like the look, uh, like the, she's very intellectual, she's very conceptual. So I like the look and I, and I understand what she's going for. Same time, and I like the, for, for example, like she's a bride, but she's like repressed, she's tied up with the wheat and everything. It didn't read Spain 10th century to me. It didn't read anything specific to me related to the category. That would be my only sort of um, critique because it's beautifully made and it's, and I understand that even though it's sort of like, it's, it's a very simple silhouette and gown, but like the fact how she sort of stuck the, the wheat on the bottom to make it look like heavier on the bottom and everything like the proportions are very right and the shoulder pads are great. I like I want those shoulder pads. <laughs> weddings in the 10th century are probably very similar than weddings in the 5th century and the 15th century and the 17th yeah. century and probably the 19th century even. So, you know, the woman that is a prisoner and that she has no will. The first time that we, she, we see her padded. Oh, true. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the last one. I think yeah, because she said she's going to rely on that body, yada, yada. <laughs> I would too, girl. Like, if <laughs> yeah. I had that body. I mean, fucking hell, yeah. <laughs> her second look, uh, it was another wedding and she chose plastic. And she wanted to make it like very trashy she had yeah you know she had toilet paper in her shoe like stuck on her shoe and she was sucking uh chewing gum on her wig um yeah. what do you think about this one i i really like the look but more than the look i love how she defended it on the runway because you can see you can see the story perfectly with how she defended it on the runway and i really like the look 
I like the, the the fact that she did it with plastic again, even if it's not unconventional materials that she had to bring to this look, she brought them. So yes. it's amazing. I, I love it. And the wig, I I I'm I'm suffering for that wig though, because getting <laughs> chewing gum out of your hair is nothing comfortable to do. <laughs> do you have an experience with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and her third look, this is the one that the other ones were looks with unconventional material as well. But this yeah. one, um, poor thing. I actually like it from the shoulders up. Yeah, I think she's just missing something on the, like I don't not necessarily a skirt or pants or anything. I don't know what I would see or how I would complete that look. But it, it is missing something, definitely. It is missing silhouette. She is very yeah. top heavy. Her shoulders yeah. are huge and she has no waist. The length is weird because she wanted to make it super short. But if you're going yeah. to go for that length, you have to make it very narrow on top and make it with the shape of an A or similar to what Judy did. Yeah. But yeah. if she doesn't know how to sew... Uh, I understand that she ended up with something like this. I, I like how she, uh, I like the headpiece that she made uh, for herself. That that actually, I think, turned out great. I think the, uh, basically, neck up, beautiful, as always. And she did the smartest thing, like, when in doubt, show your ass. That's oh, great, yeah. great lesson in life. Okay, Yuriji del Kli. Okay, um, Yuriji del Kli comes out like a monk, basically. And she reveals into her Juana de Arco, Joan of Arc, which is nowhere near the 10th century. And not even in Spain. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we'll forgive her. Well, you know, she lives like she grew up in Belgium and she lives in Paris. Yeah. So, yeah, no, and, and I understand, like, again, like she's doing 15th century France, fine. Like, but still, like, I think when you do, because obviously, obviously, people are not going to be well actually this is not the 8th 10th century the 9th century whatever whatever like it reads medieval and yeah. you get exactly the story that she's trying to say so i would give her a pass on this like not being really spain 15th century or spain 10th century rather i guess the wings sort of blew everyone away and myself included so i think that was the important part and the, and the piece that needed to be featured the most and she chose uh john of arc because uh, she says it's the first trans man in history uh, by her sources probably not but she's <laughs> doing boy not. drag and she still yeah. looks like the most beautiful gorgeous creature dressing as a knight uh can be quite easy to make it look cheap or or costume or not elevator or whatever so the fact that she did like sort of like only the top part but then the bottom part is like asymmetrical because in one she's wearing like more of an armor kind of shoe or boot and the other one she's just wearing an ankle boot Again, amazing. She did, and the asymmetry with the, the arms as well. She's wearing one arm is armored and the other one is naked. Yeah. So it's, in the I opposite side, with, so it brings yeah. like the symmetry. Yeah. Yeah, and I think she's playing with the the fact that as an angel, right, like uh, genderless angels, like uh, ascending to heaven, like it's sort of like more ethereal than just like dressing as a knight. Her second look <laughs> is basically like a little Swedish girl. So back backstory for this is that. Yeah. Um, in the 60s, probably, I think they opened the first um, airline, like the first travel to from Sweden to Malaga. And we started getting a lot of tourists from Sweden. Um, yeah. This became like a cultural thing because our dictatorship was kind of ending in the 70s. And after like we had a period called in this step, especially in films and in TV, where um, people started showing a lot of skin on TV after many years of repression. So mm -hmm. it was a running theme, the Swedish ladies. Yeah. Las suecas, they <laughs> <say>. <laughs> she, she was referencing, obviously, a very specific moment in time in, in history that was also very important in Spain, as you said, like it sort of opened the borders and like censorship was sort of relaxing in a way. But at the same time, she the character was very clear, clear from the beginning. Like she walked into the runway, like jumping, like like basically she was like a young ingenue girl that she was going to get filmed by like uh, one of these like uh, Spanish directors. When she revealed the lingerie with the full um, bush, let's say, yeah, the that merkin. Was, <laughs> yeah, the merkin. That was that was. I mean, she had the attitude, she had the outfit was clear, like you could read what she was 
selling and the murking killed me again. Yeah, because the people from out of Spain, I think, have seen everything blurred, like no nipples, no murking, no anything. But she had like a big bush. That was yeah. It was a thing when you started seeing bush on TV. Like that was. <laughs> you mean George Bush? Oh no, yeah, uh, no, but. <laughs> And her third look, she did a retro, futuristic, based in Barbarella and, you know, the Jetsons and all these things, maybe. Um, she, I think she's very smart. This is what yeah. I thought that uh, Marina should have done with her third look with, you know, yeah. the structure and everything. This is very easy to make, kind of. And I think she did a very smart job with the green. She had the green boots because, she, and again, she had a green merkin. <laughs> How many merkins did she bring? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miguel, so thank you very, very much for coming and talking with me. It is a huge honor. I've been following you since the very, 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 very beginning. And my children <laughs> thank you. love and adore you. <laughs> They're going to freak out when I tell them that I'm here talking with you. <laughs> So thank you so, so, so Say much. hi to them. <laughs> thank <laughs> you so much for inviting me. I watch and I recommend all of your reviews to all my friends, like especially the English ones, because obviously like sometimes I'm like, I don't have time to explain. Marta <laughs> like has explained much better. Like she has much more patience. Please, please watch, watch her. Don't, don't, don't bother me with your questions. <laughs> and, and so like, thank you so much. It was so fun to be here. So the winner this week is Draxetlas. I think it was very well deserved especially because the best look from the three looks that she brought was the third one and the way she used unconventional material I think it was very well deserved but it could have been Benedita perfectly and the bottom are Estrella and Diamante you know I love them both very very much I think Diamante is an excellent performer it is very difficult to out lip sync the amante. But then they announced the song that's Que se, no, se nos rompió el amor de Rocío Jurado. And this is one of our big divas of the Spanish song. And she's from Andalucía. She's from the same province as Estrella. And once I knew that that was going to be the song, I was okay. I knew that we were in for a great lip sync from the two of them. They both did an amazing job. Estrella went to the back of the stage and just embodied Rocío Jurado. Rocío Jurado is probably the artist that drag queens use the most, probably, or maybe traditionally, that she has been that type of artist. Estrella did slightly better, and she gets to say, and Diamante very sadly had to leave the competition. I'm very sad for her. I thought this episode was a very good episode for Diamante, but well, you know how it is. You know that you're probably going to go home eventually. Only one of them is going to win the whole thing. So I'm glad that Diamante had the opportunity, even though she had a weird edit and the talking head especially, but I'm glad that she had the opportunity to show her talent, she had the opportunity to show that she is a lip sync queen and that she's a dancing queen and I, I love her very much. I also want to thank the people that sent me PayPals this week. Uh, here are your names. Thank you very, very, very much. I'm going to leave you my PayPal account down below as well as Mika's PayPal account down below in case you want to support us. Um, I am donating a part of the PayPals that you're sending me to other drag queens in Spain, especially drag queens that are not in RuPaul's Drag Race. So if you want to support me and you want to support local drag, I would very, very much appreciate it. This is basically my job right now, so I really need your support. And that's all for today. Thank you very much for watching. Stay queer. I love you.